What's up everybody, Rob here. So, you've heard the Sabaton song, you know what happened in Vienna in 1683, but who were the winged hussars? Well, I'm about to tell you. And since I'm not good at introductions, and I want to keep this introduction pretty short because you know this is going to take longer than strictly necessary, here is a very quick look at the winged hussars. Alright, so before we can talk about the winged hussars, we have to establish what a hussar is. So, Hussars initially were light like cavalrymen, mostly from Serbia, but also other Balkan states as well, who were living in exile after the Ottoman conquest of their homeland. They were first employed as mercenaries by the Hungarians, but later on they were adopted by the Polish and other European powers as well. The name Hussar is derived probably from the word Gusar, meaning bandit or raider, marauder, something of that nature. The first recorded mention of the word Hussar was in the year 1500, from a Hungarian source, although they were probably in service well before then. The Hussars were light cavalry, so they were fast and very mobile. They would be used to harass the enemy's flanks and vulnerable positions. They would be used for scouting and reconnaissance, and overall played an invaluable role in blunting Ottoman advances into Europe. Now, like I said, the Hussars initially were in the employ of the Hungarians, but it did spread to the rest of Europe, especially in this particular case, Poland where they adopted this light cavalry role until the late 16th century, when under the reforms of a man by the name of Stephen Bathory, who um, has a very famous relative known as Elizabeth Bathory, aka the Blood Countess, who I just happened to conveniently have made a video about, maybe you should totally check that out. The Hussars became a heavy cavalry unit. Their light wooden shields that they would be using would be replaced with metal body armor, they would be issued larger lances, and I'll get into more about the equipment they carried a bit later, and um, they were actually made up of Polish noblemen and their retainers rather than foreign mercenaries. So essentially, the winged hussars became the exact opposite of what an actual hussar was. The original hussars were light cavalrymen, mostly from Balkan and specifically Serbian exiles, who would be used for harassing and scouting. And now the hussars were made up of, instead of exiles, actual you know native Polish troops acting as heavy shock cavalry. The Hussars went into battle in units called a Pakset, or a post. This consisted of a nobleman and about two to five retainers that went into battle along with him. These Pakzets were formed into groups of about 200 or so called a banner, or in Polish, you know, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it, it's there on the screen, there you go. Um, these could operate independently, these, you know, roughly company sized elements um, could operate like that, or more often than not, they were combined with many other banners to form a division known as a Pulk, P-U-L-K. These were tactical units as well as administrative units, which did make logistics a little bit easier. The Winged Hussars used a wide variety of weaponry and equipment, most important which being their horse, because they are in fact a cavalry unit. And they used a special breed of horse, the Polish Arabian, which is a crossbreed between large European war horses uh, crossed with um, Arabian horses, which were taken or acquired from the Ottomans. They were bred for strength, speed, and endurance, and in addition to this, they had to undergo very rigorous training, uh, being able to turn and maneuver very quickly, being able to accelerate at a very rapid pace, as well as uh, being trained for the breakers of battle. Horses, generally speaking, are very skittish creatures. They tend to panic and run away. They, they're not really um, a, a type of animal that would stand and fight. Uh, whenever they get scared, they're more likely to just bolt. So the animals had to be trained specifically to withstand the confusion and chaos of battle without panicking and utterly freaking out. In battle, the Hussars would oftentimes paint their horses with very bright colors as a way to um, intimidate their enemies and also just because it, you know, it looks cool. And in order to stay on the horse while riding it, you needed a saddle. And the saddle that the winged Hussars used was of Ottoman influence with a very deep back to support the rider after a lance point impact. They also had specially designed stirrups, which were designed to likewise help withstand the impact of a shock charge. After the reforms of Stephen Bathory in the late 16th century, the winged Hussars became a heavy cavalry unit. As such, they would be encased in metal armor as opposed to using simple wooden shields and simple chainmail hauberks and iron helmets as protection, they would be encased with articulated metal breastplates, like you see here. It looks very, vaguely similar to that of Roman Lorca segmentata, at least that's the impression that I get. It's not, and there are plenty of differences, yes, but you get the same feel there. Their chests and torsos would be generally well protected, as well as their arms and shoulders. The legs would oftentimes be protected with tassets, which um, could be articulated going down as far as the knee. 
However, in some cases, this was unavailable and the winged hussars used male aprons instead. Of course, officers and higher ranking individuals would have more extensive and much more elaborate armor than the rank and file. So the differences in the quality and the extent of the armor can be really chalked up to class differences and rank difference. To protect their head, the winged hussars used the typical lobster backed pot which is very common during this particular era, but instead of having a single bar, or in some cases two or three bars, going down across the face, they were protected by crescent, oftentimes by crescent-shaped plates that would be fitted over their faces. And this, this would be integrated into the helmet. So instead of a single bar coming down, as you can see right here, you have this crescent-shaped plate that uh, protects their, uh, their face, and especially their nose. And now the most distinctive feature of the winged Hussar's equipment, the wings themselves. It consists of a wooden frame with attached eagle or swan feathers, though occasionally ostrich or some other type of bird would be used, and they have multiple purposes. The first is pragmatic. It was to prevent attacks from behind, particularly a defense against lassos, a lot of steppe peoples that the Ottomans employed. Um, the Huns did this way back centuries before the Mongols did this. They would use lassos, which are basically, well, you know what a lasso is. It's just a rope with a knot, a loop around the end. And they would throw this over someone and they would drag a person off their horse. Uh, these large wings help prevent attacks from this particular type of weapon. Secondly, the sound they make makes like a, a weird rattling noise. And that would actually freak out horses that were not used to the sound. Their horses, of course, would be used to it due to the extensive training they've been through. Uh, but enemy horses would not be used to this rattling noise and the horses would freak out. And their own horses were used to this sound, so it would actually help to drown out the other sounds of battlefields, such as the explosions and the shouting and the, you know, metal on metal slamming into each other. And it would keep their own horses calm, since they were used to this particular noise, and it wouldn't be, wouldn't be anything for them to, you know, get freaked out over. But probably the main reason for the wings would be because it looks cool. I mean, you have, you know, hundreds if not thousands of riders, all of these wings streaming behind them. It just, you know, looks intimidating, it looks impressive. And that's pretty much what the winged hussars were going for. The hussars would oftentimes also have cloaks and capes made of exotic animal skins, for example, lion or leopard skins, or occasionally wolf skins as well. And some people speculate that it is there to, again, prevent attacks from behind. However, again, this probably is there simply as an aesthetic choice. It's there simply because it looks cool. The main weapon of the Hussars was a lance, which could be anywhere from four and a half to over six meters in length, or if you want to use freedom units, between 15 and 20 feet long, sometimes even longer. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. That is an obscenely long lance. I mean, they're going to be holding it one hand, and how are they possibly able to, uh, you know, hold something that's over 20 feet long, one-handed while charging on a horse? That would be way too heavy and awkward. And most of the time, actually, yes, that is true. That would be a problem. But the winged hussars had a very interesting and very simple workaround for this particular problem. The lances, in fact, were hollow. They would normally be made of pine or some other very lightweight cheap wood, and the center would be hollowed out, which allowed them to have this extra reach. Uh, because the lances were hollow, they were a one-time use weapon, and the lance would almost undoubtedly shatter upon impact with anything solid. And this was, of course, remedied by the Hussars moving with supply wagons, which had replacement lances. So they would charge in, their lances would shatter, they would simply withdraw, grab new lances, and then charge again. Because of the length of their lances, they would actually be able to outreach pikemen. So they'd be able to charge directly into infantry formations and be relatively safe. Again, relatively being the key word here, um, you know, there's different degrees of safety when you're dealing with this sort of thing. But, you know, they can actually outrange pikemen. So there you go. In addition to the lance, the winged hussars used a wide variety of other weapons, mostly of a close quarter nature, the most famous of which being the saber, which is a curved single-handed sword. Uh, you, I'm sure you guys know what a saber is. If you don't know what it is, well, um, there's like a lot of channels I can go into way more detail about this than I will here, but basically, yeah, it's a saber. It was, again, adopted from the Ottomans, and it's, it is an Eastern weapon that was adopted by the Polish, and actually from them, it spread into the other parts of Europe and became one of the more popular swords. But yeah, it's basically, you know, it's a saber. You should know what a saber is. Another type of sword that was very popular with winged hussars was known as a concerts. I think that's how it's pronounced. It's there on the screen. In any case, it is, unlike the saber, which was a curved blade, this is a straight bladed sword designed for thrusting. It does not have an edge, and it was used to penetrate the gaps in enemy's armor or to um, strike at vulnerable areas. The blades were roughly three feet in length, though there are versions that are pushing four feet in length, and they would be used sort of like miniature lances. 
The Hussar would charge forward with his arm already fully extended, hoping to impale his enemy on the tip of the blade. The weapon, like I said, does not have an edge on it, so if he missed with the thrust, there's very little he can do. To, he can parry with it, of course. You know, it, it is a pretty balanced sword. He can do that with it. But you're not going to be cutting with it because it does not have an edge. And we also have a weapon known as a Z-Scan. Uh, sorry, it's there on the screen. Anyway, case, it is a steel warhammer which is very similar, in my opinion, to a Beck to Corbin from the earlier Middle Ages. You know, same idea here. It is a one-handed uh, Warhammer, very small, very fast and mobile. It's not a huge, you know, Mjolnir-sized Warhammer. The pointed end on the back could punch through the relatively thin armor of helmets, and uh, the hammer end is, of course, you know, a hammer for bludgeoning. The winged Hussars also made extensive use of firearms. Now, early Hussars did use some form of ranged weapon, usually in the form of bows and arrows, but as technology improved, they used early firearms. Uh, what you see here is a wheel lock pistol, which is a one-handed pistol that could actually be used one-handed. Uh, unlike the match locks that were also common during this era, um, you needed two hands to use that to manipulate this burning match cord. And uh, it was just very difficult to um, manipulate while on horseback holding the reins and everything else. So a wheel lock pistol, uh, as you can see there, there's this wheel there. And basically that is a serrated metal, um, basically a, a serrated metal gear. And you would have in the jaws a piece of iron pyrite. Uh, you would wind this thing up. It's basically a wind-up gun. And when you squeeze the trigger, the steel would, uh, the, the steel gear would spin, causing a shower of sparks when it rubbed against the um, iron pyrite, causing a shower of sparks which would ignite the pan, and that would send the ball out the front of the, the firearm. The Hussars would oftentimes carry a brace of pistols. These things were a pain in the neck to reload, so if they would fire their pistol and they needed another follow-up shot before they could reload, they would simply drop the pistol they had, pull out another one, and fire with that. The winged Hussars would oftentimes tailor the equipment they used based on who they were fighting. For example, if they were up against fast-moving mounted opponents, they would oftentimes emphasize their range equipment, their bows and arrows, or their pistols. They would put away their lances and go for the range stuff. But if they found themselves fighting against an infantry-based enemy, they would use their lances. Okay, so the main tactic of the Winged Hussars was the heavy shock charge. To help demonstrate how this would play out, I am going to be using some Cadian shock troopers here, um, Warhammer collection. Of all the models I have, I do not have a single cavalry unit. Uh, it's all infantry, and I have a couple tanks, an artillery piece, I got a Valkyrie too, but that's pretty much it. I don't have any actual horsemen, historical or otherwise. Whatever, any case, um, that's neither here nor there. So, the Winged Hussars would often charge in ranks of three to four deep, at least initially, but then it, later on it was reduced down to two ranks as the 17th century progressed, and I'm using two ranks because it's easier to handle. So, the way the charge would begin would, is fairly simple. They would be spaced out fairly, fairly wide apart. Uh, I think it's about the length of a horse between each one of the men, and they would advance towards their enemies at a walk. Uh, the reason why they would do this is manifold. They would, um, first off, be spaced apart like this, uh, usually the distance of one horse uh, between, each, um, between each of the riders. And this was to uh, help avoid boundary um, objects. Say if there was a tree in the way, they can maneuver around it pretty quickly or, you know, like dead bodies or, you know, whatever else could be on a battlefield. You know, there's all kinds of debris and stuff there. So this is a good way to avoid that. And also, um, this was again an era where ranged units were becoming more and more effective. So you have more and more advanced firearms available. So you want to keep a pretty uh, spread out, pretty open order to avoid, um, you know, presenting this mass dense target. And they would be advancing at a walk. Now horses, uh, they tend to get very tired very quickly. So you don't want to be running the whole way. You wanted to, you know, save the horses for that initial shock charge and not have them completely tired and blown out uh, by the time you reach the enemy. You wanted to have them as fresh as possible. So they would first advance towards their enemies at a very slow walk to avoid tiring the horses out. Then they would move into what is known as a trot and then a canter. Now these are all different speeds of a galloping horse or a moving horse. And uh, it involves how many beats per minute, uh, how many you know, hoof beats per minute the horse has. And I, I'm not going to begin to try to figure that out. I'm not really much of a horse person, but whatever. In any case, um, as they would, in, as they would um, increase speed, they would then close their ranks together. So this wide formation would become a much more densely packed formation and um, they'd minimize the frontage so, so much so that one, by the time they got to their final speed, which was a gallop, which is basically just, you know, a full on, I don't want to say a sprint, but basically, you know, a, a horse running now, um, they would be in this densely packed mass. 
And, um, and, and the reason why they would be in ranks is so should somebody, um, like this guy, not you, but this guy, you know, gets shot, this guy from the second rank would simply move up to take his place. So the, the whole idea was that this front rank, the main point of impact, impact was a single unbroken line of horses and men with their very long lances, these long hollow lances, all pointed towards the enemy in this one solid mass. So basically, it's very similar to a, a pike block that they would be facing against, but this time on horseback. So basically, it's a horseback pike block. And then, um, quite simply, they would um, be at a full gallop at this point, you know, right before they hit the enemy. They'd be in this densely packed formation in these two ranks, like this, and then they would slam into the enemy at pretty much full speed. Now, upon impact, the Zars had two real choices. They could either withdraw, go back to their supply wagons, grab another lance, and try again, or they can draw their secondary weapons, their swords, their hammers, their whatever it else is they have, and continue pressing the attack. It really depends on the, um, the impact and how much of an effect it had on the enemy, the tactical situation, and a whole bunch of other factors. Uh, but generally speaking, they would be using this massive shock charge, hit the enemy with one massive punch, hopefully break through, and uh, basically, they were the battering ram for their army. They would move in, shatter the enemy, cause a massive breach in the line, which would then be exploited by either other cavalry units or possibly even um, infantry. So they were um, really the, you know, just a, a giant battering ram. They'd make a breach, make a hole where the rest of the army would then pour through. The Winged Hussars proved to be the decisive element for many Polish victories throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, where they gained a reputation for their skill, their bravery, and their capabilities on the battlefield. Their most famous battle was in 1683, when Vienna was under siege by the Ottoman Empire. In what would later be considered the largest cavalry charge in history, 18,000 cavalrymen from the Holy Roman Empire in Poland launched a massive counterstrike against Ottoman lines. This relief column was spearheaded by 3,000 winged hussars led by King Jan Sibetsky himself. Due to the size and ferocity of the cavalry charge, combined with the garrison of Vienna sallying out from the city itself to join the attack, the Ottomans were completely overwhelmed and pushed out from Vienna. And this spelled the last major attempt by the Ottomans to push into Europe and basically started the slow decline of that particular empire. In spite of their record, the days of the winged hussars were numbered. And advances in military technology, mostly in the form of better artillery and better firearms, and not only better firearms, but uh, more troops being equipped. Instead of being, uh, you know, half bike and half musket, virtually by the 18th century, everybody would be armed with muskets. And heavily armored men riding down their enemies with long lances simply didn't have a place on the rapidly evolving battlefield. And it was due to these changes that by the early 18th century, the winged hussars were disbanded. So that's it for the video. Please hit the like and subscribe button. More videos coming out whenever I get around to it. And have a good day. Or don't have a good day. You're adults. You can have any kind of day you want. I'm not going to stop you one way or another. You're free to do whatever you'd like. See you later.